Warm greetings from the Chennai Center for China Studies. It's great to meet you all in another C3S institutional dialogue on the topic China and challenges to security in space with Dr. Narmata Goswami. Today, China's space program has been growing by leaps and bounds with 2021 as one of the most successful years for Beijing in the 21st century. To explore the vast cosmos, develop the space industry and build China into a space, far, space path is our eternal dream, stated President Xi Jinping in one of his speeches. China's space capability serves several strategic goals, including economic development, security, and domestic prestige. Today, space is one of the significant dimensions of the US-China technology competition, for it not only has economic ramifications, but also military and security dimensions. For instance, China's planned space station allows it to provide costly public goods to the international community by allowing other countries to carry out experiments in low Earth orbit without daring the cost of building and sustaining a space station. For this will allow China to present itself as an alternate to the United States by projecting Beijing as a more inclusive alternative to the US as it will allow dem both democracies and autocracies alike to participate in its space initiative. Beyond China's space station, the China space technology also provides it with other diplomatic tools such as launch, satellite, and imaging services. More broadly, the Chinese space accomplishments allow it to present itself as a model and a technological leader to developing countries, thus having a soft and hard power dimensions in China's space strategy. To speak on this topic, we have Dr. Narmata Goswami. Pleasure to have you with us, ma'am. And now it is my privilege to honor our distinguished speaker. Dr. Narmada Goswami is an author, strategic analyst, and an authority on space and space governance. Her recent work include a book titled Outer Space and Great Pass, which was supported by Minerva Initiative Grant for Social Science Research. After earning her PhD in international relations, she served for nearly a decade at India's Ministry of Defense sponsored think tank, Mohan Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, New Delhi. Her research and expertise generated opportunities for collaborations abroad and she accepted visiting fellowship at countries like Norway, Australia, and Germany. In 2012, she was selected to serve as Jennings Randall Senior Fellow at the United States Institute of Peace, Washington, DC, where she studied India-China border issues and was awarded a Fulbright Nehru Senior Fellowship on the same year. Shortly after establishing her own strategy and policy consultancy, she won the prestigious Minerva Grant awarded by the Office of the US Secretary of Defense to study great power competition in the gray zone of outer space. For expertise, she has been asked to consult for audiences as diverse as Wikistrat, US Pacific Command, US Special Operations Command, the Indian military, and the Indian government, academia, and policy think tanks. With these brief words, I will now request Commodore Vijesh Garg, Executive Director, Chennai Center for China Studies, to deliver the opening address. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Bala. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Namrata, and all the distinguished members of C3S and all the our research interns and audience. The topic for today, which uh, Dr. Namrata is speaking, is China and challenges to security in space. Now, as the mankind grew, our ambitions grew with the science and technology growth. We move from the land, we move to oceans. The oceans, we move to the airspace. For aerospace, we went to the outer space and its limit is going. Now, when science creates opportunity, the other side also comes into it. When nations which are competing today's global dynamics, global equations, global competitions of power, naturally we have competed on land, we have competed on sea, we are competing in air, aviation, and now we are competing in outer space. It, now, when you look at the comprehension and power of any nation, be China, be India, be anybody, space has become a strong element in comprehension national power. Now, whether you look in terms of satellite, whether in terms of anti satellite activities, the satellite could be our navigation satellite, which is peaceful use, and could be other one which are doing the mapping, another, uh, say, military use for that matter. Now, look back 1950. When actually, you know, era of Yuri Gagarin and uh, then Neil Armstrong, we used to say moon. But today, 
the people are going to the Odyssey to the space and coming back. So we have moved that side now. But China, from the last 30 years, the small dwarf has become big Jian because China has the ambition, ambition of becoming superpower. And as he has done, made the largest navy today in my time world, what worth the time will tell. Similarly, they have moved to space. They got our ISS, they got own satellites, they got empty satellites. Now things are going on, many, 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 many fold, which Dr. Nanda is going to speak to us. But my point to convey is that China has gone from end to end in this whole space research. And people like Dr. Navata like to uh, enlighten us because she got so much experience with us from worldwide view of various places, how China has gone about it. Now, we talk with space capability, maybe launchers, maybe satellite, maybe other equipment around it, control centers. And so many things are there in, in, in this whole world. In fact, in the, the China's uh, white paper in 2021, it talks about uh, the China's space program. It makes so many points which China wants to do. And they are on track. If, if one just mark the dates, they are on track almost. Now, why doing this? So far, the US or maybe earlier, earlier USSR and Russia, they have the capabilities. Now, knowing China's ambitious space, Xi Jinping, the man can't sit, he can't sleep. He wants to make China superpower. Now, he is looking in a big way space. This is the one area you want to break anybody's monopoly and go a big chap in a big way, make China stronger that way. Now, India being a competitor, in economic terms or the Indo-Pacific, we have our interests, we have our challenges. And you see a competitor in indirection, it's all India to see what China is doing, where we are. We have all programs going very well. Of course, we are behind. Compared to economy, I think we are okay. We have our Mangalyan, Gaganyan coming up. So many things are happening. We have only have satellites. But China is way ahead of us. But good to mark what they are doing, how they have reached, what we can do. We can learn from this, how others are doing it. So today's talk is basically towards that. And I leave it here. That as a strategic analyst, students, who are doing international relations, are doing research interns, or people are watching China very closely like us, the think tank, is imperative on us to look at how China has reached, where they have reached, what they have done, what they are doing, so that when you put our mind together, what India can do next, we can put the thoughts directly. Now I invite Dr. Namrata to take on from here and enlighten us all the Chinese space program. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for setting the context. Uh, Ma'am, the floor is all yours. Once you say next, I'll be muting myself now and be sharing the screen. Once you say next, I'll be moving to the next slides. And uh, uh, questions, right. questions all will be posted in the chat box and it will be taken up uh, during the Q&A session. All right. Thank you, uh, Sri Bala Subramaniam. And thank you, uh, Commodore Garg, for that uh, wonderful uh, overview, actually, in terms of framing the talk. And so, yeah. So today's uh, topic, uh, I've been given about 40 minutes. I'll try to stick to the time. So uh, basically, the topic that was uh, requested was China and challenges to security in space. And thank you again, uh, China Center for Security Studies, or for China Studies for inviting me and for uh, giving me this opportunity. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, I think once you uh, understand that China space program is basically a part of, uh, as uh, Commodore uh, Gang was mentioning, it's a part of uh, China's grand strategy, comprehensive national thinking. I think it's uh, important and insightful to understand the mission and the drivers of China's space goals. So most of my work is based on looking at primary source as well as secondary source. But uh, as part of the Minerva grant, I was also able to do field work in China and talk to their, uh, not just their academics, but also representation from their space programs. And it was very interesting to see how they framed their space program in terms of their uh, influence and power in international relations. So if you look at the mission of China's space program as per their 2021 China White Paper, it's to protect China's national rights and interests and build up its overall strength. 
So this is something which is uh, different from, say, a country like India. So I'll tell you why it's different. So for China, space is an integral part of their national identity, but not just prestige. And I'll mention this, they actually depart from prestige and technology to including space as part of their economic development as well. And their ambitions, uh, based on my interviews and looking at their primary source document, are very ambitious. And that's why it, it's trying to play at the very high level in terms of competing with the United States and competing with India also, because it views India as a major space power in Asia. Now, some of the key drivers of China's space program are, first of all, especially under President Xi Jinping, China has actually included space as part of the Communist Party of China constitution that was amended in 2017 to uh, ensure that President Xi Jinping is president for life, unlike, say, Hu Jintao, who changed over in 10 years. And so leadership in space is viewed as a very critical component under President Xi Jinping. So uh, President Xi, under the Made in China, as you know, policy of 2025, basically pointed out that there are three very important technological priorities for China. One is artificial intelligence, two is robotics, and three is space. And all three are actually interrelated and interconnected. And if China can actually achieve a very high level of efficiency in these three technologies, it will ensure that the international system is something that China can actually mold and influence and create to the benefit of its citizens. Now, secondly, space forms a critical part of the Communist Party of China's regime's legitimacy and internal national development. So for the Communist Party, achievements in space, including their first mission to Mars, the first Asian country to actually land on Mars and send out a rover. India was the first country to reach Mars orbit. Uh, that actually created an entire discourse on how the Communist Party of China is actually good for China in terms of technological development. So it cares about its regime legitimacy as well. Now, this is something where China actually has even departed from the United States. And I would say this because looking at the U.S. space program, the U.S. space program is struggling between a space vision of economic development and a, a vision, for example, for prestige and space exploration. If you look at China's space scientists and their space policy makers, China makes it very clear that its space program is about enabling China's economic development in the long term. And they argue that a country with the highest level of economic development will be able to develop its military forces and its other influence capacity. So the end goal is economic development and everything else falls under that particular goal that they have stated. And then national security. So for China, space also forms a part of building up their military capability. And I'll talk a little bit about that in uh, the presentation as we go forward. Next slide, please. So if you look at some of China's long-term space goals based on the mission and the drivers that I have put out, and this is something where it departs from uh, actually a lot of other spacefaring nations. One is space-based solar power. So one of the important technologies that China is investing in as we speak is to develop the capability to collect solar energy in space and to beam it back to Earth through microwaves. And they started investing in this particular capability since 2010. And today they actually have demonstrated a very limited wireless transmission of power. And the aim is to actually be able to do it from space. Second, they also have invested in concepts like lunar resources and looking at technologies that can actually uh, extract resources on the moon. And I'll talk a little bit about their uh, lunar program and the implications for that, not just for the United States, but also for India, which is very critical to understand in terms of understanding China. Establish permanent presence for access. So unlike the US, China departs from the US, U.S. is talking about, for example, sending the next woman and the next man to the moon by 2028. If you look at China's stated goal for their lunar mission, it's about establishing robotic presence and building capacity to build a research station on the moon by 2036. So it's not about sending the first Chinese astronaut to the moon and, and being able to sustain that particular person for a few days. It's about building a structure on the moon, which is again a very ambitious stated program for them. Now, one very interesting uh, 
insight that comes out of China's space program is that the Communist Party of China is able to invest in long-term mission and financial capability because of the fact that once you have a particular program in place, because it's a one-party system, its ability to commit to that mission, and I'll show you how they have actually achieved this in their lunar SBSP, space-based solar power, and their Mars mission as well. Missions that were actually conceived 20, 25 years ago and achieving their capability in the, in the, uh, in the stated deadline that they actually put out. Now, uh, I think for the purposes of understanding the security implications of China's space program, it is really important that some of the documents that they have put out, for example, the 2006, 2016, 2021 white paper on space clearly identifies space, as Bala Subramanian was saying, in terms of looking at it from a grand strategic perspective, but also comprehensive national power, and they state it in an official document. And then uh, their military strategic guidelines, their doctrinal changes, I'll talk to, about that also in terms of how that has fit into their overall national security capability. Next slide, please. So some of the critical changes, I thought, since uh, we have now President Xi Jinping in power, what are the critical changes that has happened in China's grand strategic thinking that is important to keep in mind when we think about China's space program? One, unlike President Hu Jintao, who was more about the peaceful rise of China, I mean, he also supported the national rejuvenation, the concept of the China dream, but not to the extent how President Xi has changed the entire structural thinking of the Chinese uh, strategic community and the Communist Party of China. He puts it out in his uh, thought that he has published and also in terms of the white papers and speeches that he gave. One is that one of the critical changes in China's thinking is talking about national rejuvenation and comprehensive power. Recently, President Xi gave a speech to PLA officers where he argued that the loyalty to the Communist Party of China is the most important priority. China as a state comes after that. So CPC is critical and core to China's identity as a nation state. And then he urged the officers to think about the civilizational construct, how China can actually become the lead actor given its civilizational ethos and its capacity in terms of military and economic power. Now, they don't say it by naming, but it's very clear in their uh, military doctrine that they see the hegemonic power of today as their adversary. And of course, that means the United States. And this particular change actually came about since 2013. So it's very clear that they are actually competing with the US as to who will lead the international system, whether it will be a democratic system or whether it will be a system led by the Communist Party of China with Chinese characteristics. Now, many argue that the China-Russia relationship is an opportunistic relationship, but I argue that the China-Russia relationship is actually one of the key components of China's grand strategic thinking. And this I say because if you look at the documents and the speeches and the different white papers that they have published since 2000, this is about 22 years ago, Russia has been recognized as a key strategic partner and a major power relationship. In fact, President Xi Jinping, in a speech in 2013 in Kazakhstan and then in Moscow, pointed out that for China, Russia is the most important great power relationship that they are going to invest in and build, and also in space. And you can see that from the different memorandum of understandings that they have signed since they basically stated that particular uh, goal. Now, cross-domain focus. This is something that the 2015 military doctrine put out for the first time. So unlike before, space now has been included as part of an integrated network system, which is a national security implication of space. And uh, the particular doctrinal change argues that space is the platform that integrates the movement of forces, uh, surveillance, intelligence, reconnaissance, uh, out of sight uh, movement of troops, uh, precision navigation guiding, and that's why they have invested in their own Beidou navigation system, and it's a fully independent system since 2020. And so you can see that space is starting to become a very critical focus. Now, one of the interesting insights I got talking to some of the Chinese uh, strategic thinkers in Beijing and Shanghai was that for China, the 1991 and the 2003 Gulf War, in which they observed the United States moving forces uh, using space was a game changer 
for them, that was a shocking incident because till then they were dependent on very land-based uh, deterrence systems. But suddenly they recognized that space is such that if you have that capability, you actually are able to uh, engage in out of area operations without really being there. And it can be a complete game changer in terms of offensive and uh, defensive capabilities, including compellence and deterrence. So that's the time when they decided that space is going to become a critical component of China's national security. Now, China has always been hesitant to point out that they are going to be a country that's going to play at the systems level. If you remember the peaceful rise of China, it's not going to question the status quo. But under President Xi Jinping, that has changed. And so when people argue that China has got very assertive, President Xi Jinping told you in 2013 that China is going to become an assertive state in the system and is going to become a global presence. So if you look at their military strategic guideline, China has argued that they are going to work towards extended global presence across domain and then to take the strategic initiative for global leadership, including in space. So it's not going to be active defense. It's going to be also operationally very assertive. And that is something that you get in their space program as well. And then, of course, as I mentioned, the economic necessity of space to build up a professional military and to ensure that the party continues to remain important. Next slide, please. So some of China's grand strategic focus in space, keeping those shifts since 2013 in mind. One is the strategy is to focus on maintaining access and use. So China basically takes lessons from the Malacca Strait, which is basically patrolled by the US Navy, and they do not want to repeat such an uh, environment in space. So uh, for them, maintaining presence in low earth orbit through their Tiangong space station that is actually being constructed as we speak to be able to dominate cislunar space the space between the earth and the moon to have access to deep, deep space in the moon is a critical priority and then what is interesting is that some of the chinese lead uh, uh, heads of uh, space institutions including china academy of space technology and the china national space administration argues that china's economic return from space if they invest in that technology today is going to be about 10 trillion uh, US dollars annually. So you can see the economic rationale for space. One of the other grand strategic goal is to influence and have power to write the rules of space commerce. And this is something that China has been basically putting in place since 2014 with their document 60. It's a document that is available and translated in English. And I, I would urge you to read it because it kind of tells you how they are actually trying to build up their private space sector as well in competition with the US private space sector. Now, civil military integration revised by the 2021 National Defense Law is a critical component of China's space strategy as well. So every Chinese space entity, including their private sector, has to work within the civil military fusion strategy. And then this is something that the Chinese space uh, documents clearly differ from the U.S. space documents. So unlike the U.S. space documents, including the policy documents that talk about space exploration, China talks about space utilization and space development. So it's a very different conceptual thinking that they have put in place. And this is, of, of course, influenced by several of their influential thinkers. In India, a person who actually talked about this important need to shift India's thinking in space was former President Abdul Kalam. Uh, if you listen to his speeches, he had pointed out that if India has to become an important player in space, India also needs to think about space from an economic perspective, which is investing in concepts like space-based solar power. And he gave this really inspiring speech in 2007 in the university in Boston, where he talked about why India needs to do that. I don't think it has happened though in India's space program, but China has actually started looking at it from a space economic development perspective. Next slide, please. So uh, some of President Xi Jinping's speeches are critical to understand the grand strategic thinking I pointed out. So if you look at one of the speeches he gave to the engineers of the Chang'e 4 mission, which is their far side lunar landing mission, he pointed out that the mission's crew members carry the space dream of the Chinese nation, developing the space program. This is a critical line, and he keeps repeating this in several speeches since then, 2016, 2019, 2021, 2022 speeches. 
he argues that developing the space program and turning the country into a space power is the space dream that we have continuously pursued and basically a dream that we are striving for. And also, if you notice the second speech that I put there in the second quote, realizing the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, every industry and every person should dream and strive courageously. So basically calling for a whole of society approach to space. So President Xi has equated the spirit of space, to the spirit of the long march, which is the march that Mao actually conducted to create the People's Republic of China. So he has raised the profile of space within China. Next uh, slide, please. So uh, this is why I think I basically study and work on China's space program, given the fact that I also originate from Northeast India. And uh, one of the areas that I actually did field work in was Arunachal Pradesh. And so, as you know, China claims Arunachal Pradesh even today, and they continue to have intrusions across the border, uh, creating anxiety and concern within the local perspective. But this is actually drawn from Chinese strategic culture. And this is something that we actually need to keep in mind when we think about China's space program as well, because China connects space to its capability for, for example, in a border conflict with India as well. And they very clearly state it in terms of movement of troops, uh, intelligence, reconnaissance, surveillance, uh, satellite images. And so they have been investing in that capacity. So, for example, one of China's very important strategic culture insight is that it connects territory to resources. So the fact that they claim Arunachal Pradesh is not just because it has that historic connection to Tibet and the Dalai Lama, but also because Arunachal Pradesh is rich in resources and has several rare earth metal resources that can be actually explored. And they make it in some of their arguments. And also, if you look at their claim on the South China Sea, it is about resources. If you look at their claim on Tibet historically, it's about the water resources of Tibet and other resources. Antarctica, where China is actually increasing its presence today and actually violating some of the conditions of the Antarctic Treaty by overfishing and first presence benefit. So they always argue that if China is somewhere first, you look at it in their argumentation around the South China Sea, they argue that because they were there first, they have entitlement. And then core and legitimate interests. So they make a distinction between core, which is Taiwan, and legitimate interest, which is space. And for example, some of the uh, Russian uh, invasion on Ukraine, they call it as Russia's, Russia's legitimate interest. So it's very interesting that strategic culture is very much based on that. A very similar argument they make for Arunachal Pradesh, for example, when I talk to some of their thinkers, they insisted that they, uh, Arunachal was part of historic Tibet and because Chinese empire was there first, which is a false argument. I, I have done field work and have countered that argument, but that's the argument they make. And so we should keep that particular strategic culture in mind when we think of China in space. Next slide, please. And so where is China today in regard to the space goals that I talked about? So space-based solar power, their lunar mission, their asteroid mining concept, and their military space capacity. Next slide, please. So if you look at space-based solar power, which is the technology that's going to be the game changer if the country cracks it. So in 2022, the China National Space Administration gave an update in the US actually, in the International uh, Space Development Conference that happened last month. So they pointed out that numerous launches of the upcoming Long March 9, which is going to be tested in 2030, is going to basically construct space-based solar power satellites uh, 35,000 kilometers above the Earth. It's a very small scale demonstration test that's going to be uh, shown in 2026, but they hope to do a megawatt level power generation by 2030. And by 2050, they want to actually showcase a commercial gigawatt level power generation. Now, for me, when I see this kind of statements, what I do is that I look at whether they have actually given funding and what is the state of their particular space-based solar power uh, program. And what was interesting was that this particular concept was uh, basically conceived by the Chinese uh, Space Agency in 2010. But in 10 years, they've actually established a project and they have actually showcased very limited wireless transmission of power. Next slide, please. 
Now, these are the presentations that the CNSA basically gave, and they were made publicly available. So you can see that they have given us a roadmap in terms of what they want to achieve by, say, 2050. And they've revised some of their data set. And so it's a very interesting investment in long-term Chinese economic capability, because if you're able to have access to 24-hour sunlight and are able to microwave and beam it down, you can actually become a... a a renewable energy dependent economy and not a fossil dependent economy. And they're keeping that particular perspective in mind. Next slide, please. Now, China's focus on the moon. I don't think we under realize, and uh, sometimes even in the US, people don't seem to realize that China's focus on the moon is not about just sending uh, humans to the moon. It's about, as I said, permanent presence. They are actually identifying certain very strategic locations on the moon. One is, of course, the South Pole, the far side of the moon. China is the first country to actually achieve a landing on the far side in 2019. But they're prospecting for resources. So the Chang'er 4 is still active as we speak, and they have a radar that's actually penetrating the lunar surface to look for helium-3 and rare earth metals like uh, silicon and platinum. Because the moon, according to Paul Spudis, a uh, NASA scientist, is very rich. And the Clementine mission actually confirmed, along with Chandrayaan-1, the presence of water ice, which can be very useful for life sustainability and rocket fuel for, uh, for basically rockets to deep space. And they view L1, Lagrange point 1, Lagrange point 2 as critical. And China is the only country that has a satellite, a relay satellite in Lagrange point 2 today. So basically to relay images back from the far side of the moon. Now, China became the second nation in the world in the, uh, as part of the Chang'e 5 mission to establish a fabric flag on the moon. And they were very proud. If you listen to their narratives, they argued that in the 21st century, China is the only country that is able to actually go to the moon and land there successfully, uh, if not human landing, but robotic landings. Next slide, please. Now, these are some of the lunar missions that they have actually succeeded. And what is even more astounding is that they have succeeded in these missions on time. So these missions were announced in 2002 along with the years. And I actually studied it and, and looked back as to when they announced it, whether they achieved the missions on time. So Ouyong Xiang, who's the father of China's lunar program, in 2002 gave a speech in which he said, China will go to the lunar far side by 2019. That was about 20 years ago. And they actually achieved that particular mission on time. And that's something that is astounding in terms of their Long March 5 rocket actually failing twice to uh, launch and finally succeeding. And so uh, and so 2020, uh, they basically brought back lunar samples uh, back to Earth. But if you see the missions which are in red, these are the missions they want to achieve in the next few years. So 2024, they want to bring back samples from the lunar South Pole. And then they want to survey the South Pole for understanding the composition and then establishing a research base in collaboration with Russia, of course, with whom they signed a memorandum of understanding in 2021. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of uh, March, there's a March 2022 update from Wu Wering, who's the chief designer of China's Lunar Exploration Program. And he gave this interview to Chinese media, and he talks about the phase four of its lunar mission. So if you listen to the talk, it says Chang'er 6, which is a mission in 2024, will attempt to retrieve one or two kilograms of sample from the lunar south pole. The Chang'er 7 will land on the south pole of the moon with the goal of looking for water ice and surveying the region's environment. The Chang'er 8, the phase, final phase, will scout how to exploit. Now, this is something, again, extremely important to keep in mind. This is not about exploration. This is about exploitation of the lunar resource surfaces. And he makes it very clear. And he's actually the main uh, thinker and scientist behind China's lunar program. And he says that the Chang'e 8 mission will scout how to exploit the resources on the lunar south pole and why they will actually create a base on the moon because the moon's gravity is lower than Earth and to launch from the moon is much more easier. And so we'll have to wait and see whether they succeed in these missions. But till now, Wu Wering's uh, deadlines have been met. So we have to keep that in mind as well in terms of looking at China's space program strategically. Next slide, please. Now, China's Mars mission is and Mars ambitions are pretty high. So China became the first country to independently launch 
orbit and land on the Mars surface in its first attempt. So the first attempt, which it didn't do independently, was with Russia. And as you remember, the Russian rocket failed to launch after it reached low Earth orbit to the moon. And so when China actually started investing, that's the time they took the decision around 2002 to build a Mars program. And so and, and uh, they are the second country in the world that actually has successfully communicated back from Mars. The Soviet Union landed on the Mars surface but failed to communicate. And so you can see that they are catching up with US space capacity as well in terms of their Mars mission. Next slide, please. And this is an update that came up from Wang Xiang, who's the head of China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology. And he gave a presentation last year, and again, repeated it this year, in which he identified some of China's Mars mission goal. So in by 2030, they want to become the, probably the first country to try to bring back samples from Mars. And then what is interesting is that he's talking about a human mission to Mars by 2037 and of building a Mars base by 2041 and an Earth-Mars cargo system by 2043. Now, the technology that they are investing in and has made a priority is nuclear propulsion. So nuclear propulsion is key to go to Mars because, as you know, the distance to Mars is very high. It takes about nine months to a year. That is, can be very hard on the human body. But nuclear propulsion can actually bring it down to about two months because it's very fast. And so China is actually investing in that capability and hoping to clinch that capability by 2040. And the roadmap to Mars was revealed by the China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology. Next slide, please. Now, one concept that they are also investing in is the concept of asteroid mining. It's a big concept in the US. There are several US companies that are looking at this but have not succeeded as yet. Uh, so China's Zhanghe asteroid exploration mission is going to be uh, launched this year in 2022. And the aim is to basically reach the near Earth asteroid, the number is given there, 2016 H03, and to bring back samples back to Earth and then it wants to actually do a journey to the main asteroid belt. So the idea is that because asteroids are so rich in resources, which has been again proven, several uh, literature exists. Uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory has put out several data sets telling us what the resources are. Uh, for example, a very small asteroid like 16 Psyche has resources like platinum, iron ore, gold to the worth of uh, $20 trillion. And so China's argument is that if they're able to actually get to an asteroid and bring some of those uh, rare earth metals, which they actually lead on earth back, they can actually extend their economic capability even more. And what is uh, strategically important is that Russia and China have signed a joint asteroid mission plan to achieve this particular goal. Next slide, please. Now, China is also actually competing with Star, uh, Star, uh, SpaceX. So China actually has uh, started building its low Earth orbit satellite constellation, which is about 36,000 satellites by 2030. And according to the International Telecommunication Union, they have filed to launch about 12,992 satellites by 2026. This particular low, uh, low Earth orbit satellite constellation will invest in satellite internet and also is listed as China's critical infrastructure. So unlike the US or India, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, China has actually identified space as a critical infrastructure. So which means that for China, space will receive priority investments. And so very few technologies are identified as critical infrastructure. And this is a really important shift in China's thinking under President Xi Jinping's uh, 2035 China goal. The U.S. actually has not declared space as a critical infrastructure. There, are, there is pressure uh, to declare space as a critical infrastructure, but it has, hap has not happened as yet. Next slide, please. Now, uh, as uh, was mentioned before, China is establishing its own Tiangong space station. And this is a map I got from the uh, image I got from China Space uh, Manned Space Agency. And you can see that the space station is smaller than the International Space Station, which is about 400 tons. This is 66 tons. But uh, what is interesting is that this station is going to be able to enable China to understand how to live in space for a longer period, 
uh, and for more uh, taika knots. So from three months under Tiangong 1 and Tiangong 2, which were the earlier space labs, they're going to be able to extend life for six months. And then they're also going to be building their space cargo system with the Tianzhou cargo, which is indigenously built by China. And so, uh, and this space station is also open for international collaboration in actual uh, competition with the International Space Station. And they actually pointed out that they're going to, sign, they have signed an MOU with the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs to do this. Next slide, please. So, uh, and then this is a very interesting update. So, uh, and and so to under, if you look at China's space program, one of the ways you can understand and actually validate some of the goals is to look at their five-year plan as well. Is it mentioned in their five-year plan? So as for China's 14 five-year plan, the National Natural Science Foundation has allocated about $2.3 million to actually study the feasibility of building a kilometer wide space station, which is a huge structure in space. And so the argument is that they want to bring down the launch costs with the Long March 9. And I'll explain that to you in the civilian space capacity as to why that is critical. Next slide, please. And so uh, the white paper was mentioned uh, of 2021. I think what is critical is that there is a departure from the white paper of 20, 2016. And this is something that, again, tells you what China is going to invest in in the next five years. One is that space industry is a critical component of overall national strategy, which means private space sector. And then reusable and heavy lift rockets. The only advantage the US has today over China is reusable rockets. SpaceX is creating an amazing edge for the United States because with reusability, the cost to launch is so low that you can actually afford to have several launches of your satellites and your human space program. China doesn't have that capability as yet, but are building towards it and hopes to achieve it by 2025, which is about three years from now. And then space is part of their Belt and Road Space Infrastructure Project, which is actually even a competition with India, because as you know, China's Belt and Road Initiative, including the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, is about establishing economic capability and building very strong partnership with countries in South Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Europe. And space is part of that particular Belt and Road Initiative. And then if you see, this is something that they had never stated before. And that is lay a foundation for exploring and developing cis lunar space, which is the space between the Earth and the Moon. And then uh, China has actually uh, invested now in a planetary defense system, which is asteroid deflection. And so again, very large ambitions in their white paper. Next slide, please. Now, China has also developed a perspective on US commercial space because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So several Chinese military documents have been put out in which they have identified uh, US companies like Maxar, uh, which provided satellite images of the 40 mile Russian convoy as part of the adversary system. Now, what is interesting is that Maxar is also the company that provided uh, the world with images of Chinese buildup in the line of actual control in Ladakh. So the images that they put out was what we saw when we saw that 2020 uh, building of structures. Maxar was also the company that provided images of China's buildup in Bhutan, for example, in 2017. And so they are now starting to view US commercial space companies as a threat to their ability, for example, to uh, engage with Taiwan in the future. Next slide, please. Now, China-Russia, as I mentioned before, is a very critical part of their space development and collaboration. And uh, in 2021, China-Russia signed a memorandum of understanding to actually build a lunar base together on the moon by 2036. And Russian uh, President Putin actually pointed out in April of 2021 that that's going to be a strategic focus for Russia as well in terms of building up that capability. Now, next slide, please. So uh, this is the this is basically a press release by the China National Space Administration and Roscosmos, in which they tell you what they are going to actually build on the moon. So there, this this is the particular base uh, that you can see, and then these are the different phases as well as the systems that launch systems that they are going to use to basically achieve this particular capability. Now, one thing which is interesting about China is that how do you 
shift between propaganda and actual capability. Now, my argument is that when I investigated some of Russia, China's claims, once they make it to an official document and are actually put out as a part of an international partnership, the Chinese Communist Party of, uh, actually cares about legitimacy and face as well. And so we have to take it very seriously once they put it into a white paper and then uh, launches it at a very high level, which means that they have actually looked into the technology and have come to the conclusion that they should be able to achieve these goals in the time period that they have said. Next slide, please. Now, Belt and Road Initiative for India, it's very important to keep this particular relationship in mind because the uh, while the Belt and Road Initiative, for example, in space looks benign, because it's about infrastructure development. It also means that China is using the Belt and Road Initiative to extend its influence and reach in countries which are historically, for example, India's strategic neighborhood. A country like Bangladesh, country like Nepal, country like Sri Lanka, where, as you know, debt has become a very risky uh, issue, Maldives. And so it is important to look at it from a strategic perspective as well. And the fact that China is actually promising to launch for free some of the satellites of these countries create a huge uh, mechanism of influence and capability, which India needs to keep in mind when it thinks about China in space. And uh, as we know, there are about 140 member nations of the Belt and Road Initiative, including some US allies like New Zealand, uh, Austria, Italy, North Macedonia, and recently Luxembourg. Luxembourg, which has the most uh, strategic uh, space legislation for exploiting space resources, signed an MOU with China and became a member of the Belt and Road Initiative. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just to point out that uh, Russian president gave his legitimacy to the Belt and Road Initiative and supported it. And uh, he took part in the Belt and Road Initiative forums twice, 2017 and 2019, before COVID uh, hit. Next slide, please. So civilian space capacity, keeping Russia, uh, China's space goals, their grand strategy and their lunar, Mars and other missions. So some of the civilian space capacity that we need to keep in mind is the Long March 5, uh, which is their main uh, rocket today and with the capacity to take 22 tons to low Earth orbit. They're also investing in reusability. So the Long March 8 has already been tested. And iSpace, uh, China's private space company, has launched to orbit already, as you know. And so they are also investing in a reusable rocket called Hyperbola. The companies that are actually developing China's reusable capability is Casey and Cult. And uh, now the I would argue that the most critical game changer for China will be the Long March 9. So which will be capable of lifting about 140 metric tons of payload into low Earth orbit and 50 ton spacecraft to lunar transfer orbit. Now, why is this critical? Because the only rocket that can compete with the Long March 9 is SpaceX Starship, which is a reusable rocket. It has not been uh, tested as yet. Uh, they have done some few tests, but have not been able to demonstrate its full safety. And so Russia, uh, China wants to achieve this particular rocket capability by 2030. It has very similar uh, capability. Next slide. So some of the Long March 9 goals that were listed by the designer, Le Lohao, is that these are the missions. Launch a Mars robotic exploration mission, uh, deep space missions, and if you see the last goal, constructing orbital solar power satellite. Now, why is this reusable rocket critical? So from a strategic perspective, it's critical because it brings down the cost of launch. So today, the cost of launch from the US is about $10,000 per ton for the uh, Falcon Heavy and about uh, $5,000 for the Falcon 9. The Starship promises to make uh, it about $200. Think of the amazing launch costs uh, falling down. China hopes to do a very similar capability. Now, once launch costs come down, the ability to construct and send constructing materials up to space is very cheap. And that is why China is also investing in a reusable rocket capability. And this also adds to your military space capacity. Next slide. Now, if you look at China's military space capacity, these are the capacities they have, which India needs to keep in mind because India does have a disputed border with China and uh, China has uh, continuously questioned India's legitimacy in some of these areas. 
One is, of course, ground-based laser. They have that capability. They have the capability to blind and disable another country's satellite, which means that if you are dependent on satellite for force deployment, command and control, China has the ability to create problems there. They have an anti-satellite capability. The SC-19 model on the DF-21 was tested in 2007. And they have continued to build that capacity without really testing it physically, but in simulations. Uh, they have demonstrated a robotic arm on the SJ-21 by which they can grab an adversary satellite. Uh, they have showcased rendezvous and proximity operations. And then they are the only country with a quantum satellite that actually is unhackable. The moment you hack into that satellite, it changes its code. Even the US hasn't tested a quantum satellite as well. And China actually is the first country to establish a separate space force. The People's Liberation Army Strategic Support Force was established in 2015, tasked with uh, special skills for space and cyber and network-centric warfare. The US established the space force in 2019. And then in July 2021, uh, the Financial Times uh, reported that China has tested a nuclear-capable hypersonic glide vehicle that traversed low Earth orbit. China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs argues that this is basically a test of a reusable spacecraft, denying that it's a nuclear-capable hypersonic glide vehicle. But testimony to the U.S. Congress uh, by U.S. intelligence basically confirmed that this was a test of nuclear-capable hypersonic glide vehicle, which means that it can traverse LEO and reach a particular destination very quickly. Next slide, please. And so before I end, I know I'm running out of time. So if you look at the People's Republic of China's commercial space, now people, the most argument in the US is that commercial space is the strongest in, in the US, but actually China has been investing in commercial space since 2016. The funding for commercial space was about 3 billion in 2021, but is expected to become 6 billion in 2022. And these are the companies. So Link Space, a Chinese uh, commercial company, has already demonstrated a reusable launch. They sent up a craft to about 300 meters and brought it back. But that's how you test this particular technology. And then you have One Space, which is also looking for a reusable launch. And then you have Galaxy Space and Galactic Space that is looking at building low Earth 5G constellations. And uh, they are also building commercial spaceports. One, Wangchang, which is already functional, and then a new spaceport for launching and becoming the launch facility for the world. Basically, since now we have 73 space agencies in the post-Cold War period, unlike two or three in the Cold War, several countries are now investing in their space capacity and wanting to launch satellites. And China wants to become the uh, basically the source for other countries to be able to launch these particular capabilities. Next slide, please. And so some of the future timeline that we need to keep in mind, and these are important. So these are basically officially put out, and that's why it's very important that I build this into my analysis. One, of course, is a permanent space station that they have already succeeded. And then if you look at the timeline by 2034 asteroid exploration, uh, 2024 lunar sample return from the South Pole. Again, if they succeed, they'll become the first country in the world to do it. A Mars sample return back to Earth by 2028. And then by 2040, they want to achieve nuclear propulsion capability. Next slide, please. And so summarize, and I think uh, based on the analysis that I provided, it is very clear that space is actually now a very important part of the Communist Party of China's constitution. The major goal, and this is something that is also critical and has consequences for India, and that is to become a foremost nation in space by 2045. And space is actually playing a critical role in the 2049 centennial celebrations of the People's Republic of China. So that's the 100 year celebration. China has a very integrated strategy to achieve space goals and build artificial intelligence. Some of the goals for utilization and development are space-based solar power, concept of space mining, permanent presence, and then China has also met its uh, space goals. My last slide. So basically consequences for India and the Indo-Pacific. I think one of the book that very clearly highlights how China could become a security consequence is uh, 
external affairs minister Jay Shankar's excellent book, The India Way, where he identifies what is the Indian way of dealing with this particular systemic struggle between China and the US. And also he argues that while India has national interest and national security as a key goal in uh, deciding how it's going to navigate this particular system, India is a leading power and it's not a great power yet. But India can actually shape the international system to its advantage. And so he argues that India's strategic policy is to engage the US but manage China. But my argument is that if you have to manage China, you have to also understand that China is actually raising the stakes in terms of its space capability. And then China's space, military space capacity, and the fact that it wants to become the economic power in space has implications for India. India's constrained capability in its own neighborhood. China's presence and extended presence means that other countries will have taken decisions based on that particular context change. And also China's military space capacity, they have about 100 military satellites today, means that its ability to carry out ISR in the India-China border areas, including some of the disputed area, troop movement uh, is very high. And so uh, the consequences of this for India, including with the Belt and Road Initiative, is something that India needs to actually keep in mind. So I'm going to end there and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Navrata. To put it in one word, it was fire and fury. Thank you for the excellent uh, presentation. Now I'll take on questions from the uh, chat box. Uh, the first question is from uh, Mr. Subramanian uh, Sridharan. He has thanked you uh, for the comprehensive uh, overview. He has asked, while exploiting space resources can be legitimate activity in many cases, it is there other activities where they try to disable or destroy the space platform for other countries, which have created a great concern. Uh, both China as well as Russia seem to be collaborating on these activities. What is your opinion about this? Yes. So. Uh... One of the biggest concern for the international space community is, of course, anti-satellite weapons, right? So if you destroy a particular satellite, you create space debris. So, for example, the uh, Chinese ASAT test of 2007 created about 3,000 pieces of debris. Now, if you look at the environment of low Earth orbit, there are several satellites, including about 4,000 satellites today, which we depend on. For example, when you are using your ATM, or you're using your GPS, or you are using any e-commerce platform, it's, it's supported by satellite capability. So it's critical infrastructure, including banking systems, weather forecasting. We talked about the monsoons just before we started. Weather forecasting is key in understanding how agriculture. So I think what when, when you have low earth orbit debris, it creates problems for satellite movement, and that can actually destroy this particular capability. So Russia also tested an anti-satellite weapon uh, last year, which created 1,500 pieces of debris. India tested a uh, low Earth orbit, but the Indian test, which is interesting, which RAND report actually pointed out, is that it was at such a level that the debris did not stay for long. So it was not very high in the low Earth orbit atmosphere. The Chinese test uh, was about 800 kilometers above Earth. The Indian test was below 300 kilometers, so the debris fell back. So you have to be responsible when you actually do this kind of activity. But the Chinese test was basically a demonstration to the U.S., for example, that they can question the U.S. space uh, system. So it was a signaling. And the Russia-China collaboration is pretty high in terms of building this capability. So there is concern and legitimate concern from the international community that there is no body that can actually adjudicate this particular dispute. Secondly, there is no space traffic management consensus. So today, the United Nations is trying to build a consensus, but it's not close to any kind of understanding as to how do you manage space traffic management? How do you actually have space situational awareness? How do you share data? Uh, and so this is a very big concern in the international community. And, and as far as my analysis goes, there are efforts to build such a system, but it has not succeeded as yet. And the reason it has not succeeded is because space is also seen as a national security forum, and countries are very shy to tell you what their military satellites are. Even they do not inform the registrations, including the US. And so, and so it is a legitimate concern. Thank you, Dr. Namrata. Uh, I have two questions. 
uh, one is you mentioned about china creating its own space force uh, in that uh, you know china has designated space as a military uh, doc, uh, as a military domain so what are its implications this is my first question and second is can you throw some light on the chinese laser system because that also has a, a bearing on the anti satellite uh, component yes absolutely so if you look at uh, the the implication of china's uh, declaring space as an operational domain right so that means that they will be using for example their anti satellite capability in case a conflict breaks out say over taiwan or say god forbid in the india china border area right in case conflict escalates so that means that in their joint integrated thinking and network centric warfare space space is critical in terms of looking at it from the operational concept and this is something which i think needs to be highlighted so if you look at china's military doctrine there is argument even in the when my conversations in the us that it's a very uh, defensive doctrine right it's about active defense but actually if you look at their uh, operational uh, content it's very offensive so china's doctrine talks about defensive when it comes to maintaining china's core interests but the operation of the doctrine is about attacking the adversary's entire system including space systems right so it's a very offensive uh, actually uh, doctrine i would argue from a tactical perspective if not from a strategic perspective now the implication is that this means that while china has committed not to place weapons of mass destruction in space including nuclear weapons because it's a signatory to the outer space treaty that does not mean that they will not use conventional capability including their uh, laser uh, capability so if you look at china's laser capability they have actually in because you can use a laser for blinding a particular satellite right it's very and china has actually advanced in that particular capability since about so they made it a priority about uh 1996 that's what they took the decision because they realized that okay we will have anti-satellite but we also need to have capability that can immediately blind a satellite right and so today uh they have actually simulated a capability to do that it has not been demonstrated as you know but the uh, intelligence is that in open source data, my work is based on open source data. When I look at it, it is clear that China's laser capability is pretty high. And I think the seriousness of this comes from the fact that when I listen to some of the testimony in the US Senate, why the US Space Force needed to be established, the biggest concern, and I, we don't have access to classified data, but what I hear from the senators, especially Mike Rogers, it is very clear that the capability is so high that the US Air Force was criticized for not taking it seriously. And that is why the Space Force was established because of the fact that the Air Force, so the argument was that because the Air Force's focus was fighter pilots and fighter planes, it did not give importance to space systems and space structure, whereas China's space capability is the core priority because that can disable everything, including your fighter planes, right? Which depends on satellite support. And so that's how you know the seriousness of how uh, advanced they are in terms of their laser system. Uh, thank you. Next question is by uh, Commodore Vasan. He has uh, appreciated your presentation. And the question is, uh, you know, it looks like India has decades before it can come anywhere close to where China uh, is presently is. Could you please make a quick uh, analysis of uh, India's program and what are the critical areas for India to catch up uh, in terms of China, vis-a-vis -vis China? Oh, that's a great question. Something close to my heart. So I think uh, for so India's space program uh, is, as we know, pretty advanced in terms of launch capability, right? And satellite capability, but, but not anywhere close to China's. And I say this with concern, because if you look at uh, India's focus today, it's very traditional. It's about uh, sending humans to low Earth orbit, for example, the Gagayan mission, right? Or sending a civilian space uh, exploration mission, say, landing on the lunar pole, which India came very close to. But if you look at the grand strategic conceptualization, it has no ambitions to invest, for example, in space-based solar power, which is a key technology. It's a game changer. If, if China succeeds, that's going to change the game. Uh, India's focus uh, is still uh, traditional satellite launches and prestige missions, right? I would argue, if I may, in my humble opinion, that India needs to prioritize space as a grand strategic concept, 
right? So space should form a part of the entire grand strategic thinking. India should be investing more in military satellites. I know India's, uh, the Indian Army has one. I think there is funding for uh, building a satellite for the Indian Navy now, but we need much more because uh, think of the contrast of China's uh, military satellites. There are more than 100 right and it's and in geo and in leo you know and in the indian ocean which is such a critical area uh, and so india really needs to up the game there i think india should also announce a uh, national satellite constellation because that has great implications for uh, not just regional but global influence because that's where the other countries are going i think uh, the final argument i would make is that india needs to have a space resource utilization perspective as well I don't see that. In fact, in my interviews uh, in 2017, including with ISRO, I did not see that kind of thinking. There were uh, studies, right, done, but there were no policy focus on looking at space resource utilization, which needs to be done, because that's where the game is today, right? If you want to compete and become an economic power, it's critical. Now, I know that uh, Prime Minister Modi, in response to the 2019 ASAT test, pointed out that India has now joined the Forum of Space Power has that particular capability, right? But then the important question is, it has to now be played into uh, gaming and simulation, right? In terms of tabletop exercises, actually, can you actually use this capability? What are the legal implications of this capability, right? So the PLA Strategic Support Force has been simulating and gaming with their ASAT capability since 2019. And so once it was established in 2015, President Xi Jinping's direction was that, you need to have doctrinal changes and cultural changes in the PLA SSF. And, and so since then they have gamed out as to how they're actually going to use this capability. Uh, and I don't see reports like that coming out. I'm sure there are, hopefully, but I don't see that coming out. So finally, I'll say that India needs to have a resource utilization perspective, needs to have much more ambitious goals of space resource utilization, including why India is going to the moon. It's not about just going and exploring and science mission, because the mission should also be about looking at helium-3, water ice, from a very strategic perspective, right? And, and, and I think what is important is that some of the Indian uh, space uh, research organization scientists have actually talked about this, including Anil Katkotkar in a famous speech he gave in 2019. He pointed out that if India needs to be a leader in space, it really needs to invest in capacity like utilizing helium-3, for example, for nuclear fusion, right? But it hasn't happened in terms of a policy shift and it needs to, is my perspective. Uh, as a corollary, uh, as a corollary, Kamudu Basan has asked. Uh, just wanted to know if the policymakers in Delhi are in touch with you and asking, taking such invaluable inputs to tweak our own program. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Well, I have written about it, so hopefully that's what, that's the only way you can hope that they are reading your work as an academic, right? And so I just published a paper. Uh, actually, what was interesting was that the French Institute of International uh, Studies actually reached out to me the director and he said that they are interested in looking at how india can play a larger role because you know france india has very deep space collaboration including with the Ariane and india's uh, space capability right and so they asked me to write a paper and i wrote a paper looking at the drivers i think one thing which i saw uh, as i was doing work for that particular paper is that uh, the indian space research organization as you know has recently establish uh, agencies to encourage India's private space sector, right? So India established the Indian Space Agency, the New Space India Limited. Also, because there was so much criticism from the new space companies about India's very long bureaucratic process to get licensing. And because of that, many of India's new space company was incorporating in Europe, which is such a tragedy because you have so much skill you know, in terms of India's young population that is interested in space. So you have now uh, Bellatrix, you have Rebim, you have Estrom that wants to build India's private space capacity, including uh, Sky, uh, Skyro Skyroot rocket space that's building launch capability. I think India needs to really invest in diverting funding to build this capacity as China and the US is doing, right? Um, faster processes of licensing needs to be also done in terms of uh, enabling that. So, but in that paper, what was interesting was that, so the Indian contribution to the global uh, space economy is very less, it's 2%. Uh, 
uh, Indian Space Research Organization put out a particular data set. It's available in their website, which I found. But the goal is to increase it to 9% by 2030, right? But to achieve that, you have to make those correct policy interventions. And that's why gaming uh, scenario exercise is so critical, right? You identify a particular end goal, and then you identify policy intervention and uh, lacuna that needs to be done to achieve those goals, right? And this is a long process of thinking, which I think is critical for India to do as well. Thank you, Dr. Namrata. Uh, Dr. Namrata, next is my question. Just correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. Uh, my question is on uh, the A to AD, the anti-area and access denial, which China has uh, built, especially constructed in the Western Pacific. And as you all know, now Taiwan is the flavor of the season. Uh, how integrated how integrated this A to AD of China is with the space program? Because I believe there is a very strong connect between these two. So how integrated is with China's space program? And Yes, absolutely. So uh, if you look at the 2015 uh, military strategic guideline, uh, snippets of which are available, and then the military doctrine, uh, they have actually now, since the last six years, uh, very much focused on building space as an integral part of their A280, right? So area denial strategy. It's critical because if you want to move any kind of force capability, it's so much dependent on space support, right? If you want to have missiles that are integrated into that system, including your anti-aircraft missile capability. And so, and that is why, actually, I'll tell you an interesting insight I got looking at some of the thinking of Chinese PLA kernels, right? So, and that will tell you how space has become so critical and integrated, and they have actually advanced in that particular capability. And that is why you see such a response and reaction from the US, right? And I'll tell you the inside how we get to this particular conclusion, right? So in 1996, if you remember the Taiwan Strait crisis, uh, so at that time, the China did not have a satellite navigation system or any system that supports China's deployment of missiles or even tracking a missile, right? And so they were dependent on the US GPS. And so when they had sent out two missiles into the Taiwan Strait, they lost track of the missile. Allegedly, it is not confirmed as yet, the US uh, Pacific Command had turned off GPS signals, right? And so they lost track. And so that was the time when they, uh, the Chinese uh, military academy pushed for establishing China's independent navigation system, right? And so in 2020, they succeeded. They have about 37 satellites now that supports their Baidu navigation system, which is used not just for civilian, but military capability, and now is an integral part of their area denial strategy as well in regard to Taiwan. And so they have achieved full independence since 2020 to do this. And space plays a critical part in that particular uh, capability uh, as we speak. Uh, next question is by is from Mr. Subramaniam Shridharan. He has asked, the hypersonic glide vehicle that you mentioned is actually a fractional orbit bombing system, that is FOBS. The Outer Space Treaty actually prohibits placing uh, weapons of mass destruction in space. How are we to handle this situation? Yeah, so that's a great, yeah, so, so basically uh, it is, because if you look at testimony to the U.S. Congress, that's what the U.S. Uh, intelligence community has pointed out, right? And so the, but interestingly, as you know, the Chinese uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs have argued that this is not a nuclear uh, capable, you know, fractional bombing system. It's a reusable spacecraft, right? So there is difference in consensus, but how do you deal with this? So one way is to basically uh, put out very clearly that this is a violation of uh, the non-placement of nuclear weapons in any area in space, right? And China is signatory to the Outer Space Treaty. Second, is it possible to have an additional protocol, which I think is critical to actually uh, ensure that this kind of weapon systems are not located in space? Now, the Chinese argument, which we also need to understand if you want to build a counter, is that they will say that this is, even if it was nuclear, it did not stay in space because in intercontinental ballistic missiles, all of them traverse space, right? You first go into space and then you come down. So they'll argue that, okay, but we never place weapons of mass destruction in space, it traverse space, right? <laughs> so you have to, do you understand what I'm saying? You have to understand that particular argument that they might make, which they will if this particular, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the only way is to basically keep pressing that we need to have an additional protocol that says that you cannot even have nuclear capable missiles, uh, you know, going through space. But then will the US agree? That's another point because the U.S. has similar systems, 
and their systems will become dysfunctional if you have such a statement. That's why it's so difficult to get consensus. You know, people think that the United Nations is such a body that consensus is so easy because space is, after all, the province of mankind and it's a very benign environment, inspirational, right? But space is such a critical part of national security and weapon systems that nations do not sign on to agreements. And so, yeah, it's it's tricky. I, I really enjoyed that question. But if you think through it, and if you know how the Chinese strategic mind works, you have to understand that to actually create a response. Thank you, uh, Dr. Namusta. Next question, uh, uh, you know, next is my question. I just wanted to know how uh, integrated are Chinese, uh, you know, space supply chain uh, in terms of yeah. space sector and how integrated are the uh, industry, government, academia connect? Oh, yes. So that's that's a fantastic question. And so uh, so in terms of integration, so till about uh, 2014, they had not achieved the level of integration they had hoped. Right. So basically to create it as a part of a logistics system where integration happens at a very high level. Uh, so what happened was that because of that lacune in 2014 uh, on the President Xi Jinping's direction, they established a civil military uh, fusion unit at the level of the Politburo, which is the highest level of Chinese policy making and thinking. And since then, they have President Xi has made it a focus to bring about civil military integration, including air, land, sea, space, and cyber. So basically, this is part of a network informization system and that it is based on the highest level Politburo direction and then flows through the state council to the uh, central uh, military commission and then down to the uh, services right and so the integration level they are not there yet as in terms of very successful but joint operations are always a problem right it's very difficult to get all the four structures together the one thing that they're really investing in is to make the pla less uh, bulky unlike the 1950s and 60s where you had a lot of personnel making it more lean that they can move integrated integrated forces very fast but you see they've identified integration as part of their military doctrine so it's a focus area for them. And I think if I look at their doctrine, they're learning lessons from the US as well in terms of joint warfare and integration. So I think they're drawing from US as an example, but building it into their own local context. Uh, the last question is by uh, Komodo Vasan. He has asked, I'm fairly certain that you've also uh, looked out at own network-centric warfare and network-centric operations. Uh, could you provide a preliminary assessment on its efficacy and vulnerability? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, so if you look at China's several doctrines, uh, they have made important changes, right? From People's War under Mao, where uh, getting the enemy into China, to Zheng Jiaoping's People's War with technical conditions, where he argued that no, you cannot have that old People's War concept where you draw the Soviet Union, for example, was the enemy at that time. You draw them into China's heartland and then defeat them. You defeat them at the border to, uh, you know, Hu Tao's technology. So basically network centric with technological capability. To Xi Jinping's complete focus on uh, network centric informization warfare, right? So today the level of uh, China's military investment in informization basically using intelligence information to make decisions is very high right unlike say even 10 years back and so their focus is that if you want to be able to have a quick let's take a scenario so that i can make this clear so for example china has a network centric information based scenario for taiwan right so the idea is that you use the network capability to influence decisions, but not just decisions at the strategic level, but tactical operations with a very quick exit strategy. So it's not like the Russian invasion that people think China will repeat a Russian invasion of Ukraine. I don't think so, because they will actually want to exit very quickly, right? And so, and, and there is very much strategic advantage based on their uh, network-centric operational doctrinal concept that they have today. And so it's at a very high level of integration, now, the only lacunae, and I think this is a weakness, which uh, we need to think about. China has never engaged in combat operations in real time, right? It's all in computer simulation training. They do not have combat experience. 
So that could be a great disadvantage because once you use this theoretical and uh, exercises, so they do a lot of exercises, as you know, they do a lot of exercises in Tibet, Taiwan area, they do a lot of exercises in their different regimental commands, but no combat experience. So that could be a lack, you know. I, I, sir, you would know about this much more than me, but at least that is my insight, that if you do not have combat experience and have not gamed it out in real time, that is a weakness that can be exploited, actually. Uh, Dr. Namrata, thank you so much for you know patiently taking all our questions. Many useful uh, uh, discussions were brought to the table. Uh, I now request uh, Commodore R.S. Vasan to deliver the concluding letters and vote of thanks. Over to you, Commodore Vasan, sir. Uh, thank you, Bala. And thank you to Dr. Namrata. It's been a fascinating talk today. It's one of the most fascinating talks that I've heard in recent times on space and related issues, particularly as contextual. Uh, remember the old series of Carl Sagan, you know, where we had the space travel on Odyssey. And then on the other hand, I was uh, from US and China competing in the outer space. But as you know, uh, there are so many takeaways here. I might extend attempt to repeat what you already so forcefully about yesterday. I would say the participants have gained immensely from this exposure and experience. What's more relevant in, I think, this on first hand account? Uh, I can't hear. Uh, 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 Wasn't so some connectivity issues at your end? Can you hear me? Yeah, now can we can hear, hear you, sir. Yeah, now yeah. we can hear you. Can you hear me now, Bala? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry, there must have been some connectivity issue today. And uh, so, what I was saying was that, you know, it is even more valuable to us because all this is coming from first-hand account and deep research that we've been doing for decades. So we have gained immensely from this. Just a few points that I would like to elaborate on, because very recently, just about seven to 10 days ago, uh, Bala and Self met some of our own space scientists. Uh, there are some of the names that you would be familiar with. One is Dr. Chandrasekhar, and the other is Dr. Ramamurthy, and uh, Ramani, Dr. Ramani. So we met them. And uh, what uh, was striking was that uh, way back in 2015, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar has brought out a book, you know, which tells us what India should do. I'm sure you had a look at the book, you know, and here is where Chinese are way ahead of us. Not only did they read this book, they translated into Chinese, and I think they paid a royalty to Dr. Chandrasekhar and the organization. And, you know, it is widely available to the Chinese. The Bala is showing you that book. You know, you can yeah. see that book out there. It was translated into Chinese and they made it available to their scientists and the entire community who are taking these kind of decisions. That tells you how ahead they are. The only way you can uh, compete your adversary is when you try to understand what he is doing. And they are way ahead in terms of trying to understand what India's, you know, plans are in the long term. So I am a little disappointed that, uh, you know, because of the kind of system that we have, you know, which you also uh, sort of reinforced in your talk to say that, you know, perhaps we are not sure of what we want to do. China is way, way ahead. That's what has come out very clearly in your presentation, whether it is exploitation of the space, you know, in inverted commas, you know, because the rest of the liberal democracies try to look at as harnessing the oceans, harnessing the space, or harnessing the, uh, you know, the goodies of the, but over there, they're very clear. You know, space is there to be exploited. So, you know, therefore, all their policies are about how can they exploit space? You now, whether it is mining from an asteroid, you know, there are plenty of videos on Google which tells you how there are uh, people who are now uh, colonizing even asteroids to bring those things back here. So, uh, I would not like to take too much of time away except to, uh, you know, flag few issues which are there from this, which is of great importance to our researchers here in China Center for China Studies. The difference in India's approach and China's approach is very simple. The one party system has made it easy for them to influence this, bring out white papers regularly, and ensure that you know what they promise is delivered. You know, you yourself are clearly assessed that every time that they said they'll meet a particular target, it's been met. I don't think that happens in uh, our democratic India because of various uh, struggles and stresses which are uh, there. 
another important point you brought out is about the malacca dilemma you know in the maritime domain we are talking about malacca dilemma and they wanted to be sure that they are not going to have a space dilemma this is what has come out very clearly and therefore whether it is a iss whether it is the asat capability or whether it is the mining of asteroids or whether it's colonization by robots they want to be very clear to say that i am not going to space a malacca dilemma in space so which is what is i think there is total clarity in the way they have gone ahead in uh, you know not only saying what they would like to do and how they want to go about this space commerce no you did mention that uh, you know our own abdul kalam had spoken about this a 10 trillion dollar annually is a figure that we cannot just discount but what are we doing about it no they have clearly realized that there is this potential and they are going ahead with it so maybe there is so much more that we need to learn from uh, china and let's let's admit it you know whether there are good things which are happening elsewhere we should not fight shy of copying at least the the complete procedures after all chinese have done that and that's how they are, uh, they are where they are today the other point that you brought up clearly is about the bri space bri you know they started with the silk road economic belt which was purely over the road and they added the maritime silk component and then they added the cyber component and today there is a space component now which tells you how imaginative they can be in terms of trying to get the support of these 140 nations that you mentioned so you know even we tried it's not that we have tried look at our own offer of the sark satellite to these countries but one country came in the way we wanted to offer it for free and pakistan stopped it so obviously you know it's not just the ability for you to offer something for the common good but also a political kind of strength that is required an economic strength that is required to drive these policies and it is where i see that there is a great weakness in in our own approach to resolving these issues other point was of course about uh, the militarization of space enough thing has been said in 2007 you know when they uh, launched their own uh, satellite and destroyed their uh, you know defunct satellite i did write about it at that time for a foreign journal and you know the point is that we also proved that we can do it but you know our efforts are always in those bits and spurts we do something and then we lose steam so uh, you know there are at least another 15 20 points that would mean that i am repeating what you all said which is not my intention so all i wanted to say is that uh, this is uh, uh, an outstanding talk from you and i must thank bala for uh, uh, you know ensuring that uh, you know you participated in this program today and this is one of our many initiatives in the four verticals that we have identified for chennai set of china studies so the talk that we have today is under the smt and we would be very happy to welcome you here to chennai i don't know when you visited this last time but we'll definitely get you here and the other scientists and also some of the practitioners just in mahe yesterday uh, that is in manipal uh, there were some wonderful presentations uh, uh, on the very idea of uh, uh, you know harnessing space you know india continues to use the word harness and not exploit so you know, we would like to put this team together and uh, you know have you all coming over here uh, to talk to us and i'll also try and see whether we can get some policy makers from delhi because they are the ones who should be listening to these talks you know <laughs> they are the ones who should be taking notes and they are the ones who should be taking their options and they are the ones who should be bringing out white papers i am not sure how many white papers have come out from india on on harness in the space so that tells you how serious we are in terms of uh, even laying down a policy let alone let alone implementing it so you know but uh, i do not want to uh, end on a uh, Uh, pessimistic note i know there are a lot of other good things which are happening and you know and uh, the book that you quoted about uh, from uh, our own national affairs minister yes it has a lot of things i think uh, immediately we got that book here and uh, some of us have read this already so that is the way to go forward i think we are lucky that we have an national affairs minister who seems to have great clarity in his thinking but it's only question of now translating those thoughts into action in which we we have been always found wanting so let me again on behalf of all the participants uh, thank you for this wonderful session that we've had i think every minute of this has been well worth our time and your effort and uh, grateful to you and uh, let me request all the participants to join me in uh, you know putting their hands together for this great effort of yours which will be remembered 
we'll also be, we have already recorded this we'll also go up on the youtube and in our own website tomorrow and uh, i am sure it will be very well received and we will make it a point from our side to send it to the external ministry of external affairs and ministry of earth sciences thank you jai hind thank you dr namrata jai hind thank, uh, thank you thank you for your kind words and thank you for having me again great honor